Welcome to week five, our final week, and this session where we will consider digital acceleration, esports, and COVID-19. Before we start, please make sure you have checked out the course sheet for this session. This session will reflect on the notion of digital acceleration and how the COVID-19 pandemic has forced the pace of this acceleration to increase. Under normal circumstances, the ongoing advancement of gaming software and hardware, including those related to virtual and augmented realities, would constitute a key part of digital advancements beyond just gaming and esports. With the enforced isolation of populations across the globe, communication platforms such as Zoom and Microsoft Teams, for example, have gone from useful subsidiary tools to the primary means of continuing our personal, professional and academic lives. Should we consider this a paradigm shift, where our lives beyond the pandemic are fundamentally changed? Or will life return to where it was in late 2019? As gamers, esports athletes and those involved in the industry actually better placed to understand and appreciate this new world? The following discussion will pick up examples of where we were with digital acceleration before COVID-19, with examples of where gamification, for example, have influenced my own field of architectural design technology and the built environment, as well as examining whether everyone is ready for the change the force acceleration the pandemic and lockdowns have brought. Which revolution? Several years ago, I was asked to speak at a conference and was given the title, How Will the Digital Revolution Transform Design and Delivery in the Built Environment? The first slide of my presentation asked a better question, which digital revolution? Because across my industry and indeed all sectors, there are several digital revolutions occurring simultaneously and occasionally independently of each other. The same applies to digital acceleration. How this looks in certain sectors will differ and some, such as gaming and esports, by their very nature, will be at the head of this particular race. Just as we spoke in week two about seeking commonalities with regards to inclusion, why don't we start with a common point where we can all recognize the significant digital accelerator we all have? And it is not the computer. You begin to show your age when you start talking about smartphones because there is now a whole generation of people who now just call them phones, having never needed to use what I guess we may call a dumb phone or a traditional dial-up landline phone. However, in your pocket is a piece of technology operating a computer more advanced than the one that placed a man on the moon a mere 51 years ago. It has replaced numerous other devices we uh, once had in our lives, such as portable music players, cameras, video recorders, calculators, watches, as well as analog items such as books, notepads, and sketchbooks, etc. Indeed, if you are anything like me, one of the things you rarely use your phone for is to actually make phone calls as texting, messaging, WhatsApping, etc. become preferred forms of communication. At your fingertips is access to a world of information, though it is somewhat disappointing to see in many debates how little use some people make of that amazing capability. What the smartphone represents is one of the most significant disruptors in our recent history, with the disruptor being understood as a piece of technology which significantly changes our way of life, uh, essentially disrupting it for the better or worse, depending on your point of view. There was an interesting article about disruptors on the Forbes website showing how significant the race to be the inventor of the next disruptor has become. Uh, the quote is, the term disruptor has developed a unicorn status in Silicon Valley. If you didn't know better, you might think the race to disrupt was an extreme sport. As a useful example of just how many potential applications smartphones have, there was a paper produced by Canadian academics titled Smartphones, Sensors for Health Monitoring and Diagnosis in 2019. One of the starting points for this study was to consider what common sensors and technology have emerged over the evolution of smartphones. The illustration on the course sheet shows this against a timeline from 1992 to 2013. Current smartphones include as standard sensors for proximity, ambient light, humidity, temperature, pressure, fingerprint and touch, mm -hmm. as well as global positioning systems, accelerometer, gyroscope, microphone, magnetometer, etc. Now, I'm not 100% sure what some of those items are, but just as the paper the image is from sees these as tools applicable to health monitoring, I too can see how a number of these are useful for the digitization and digitalization, more on those terms in the next section, of my own sector. 
If the smartphone in your pocket can aid in the medical sector, as well as the industries of the built environment, where can they do for all our lives? And if we're talking about disruptors, it is certainly the case an argument can be made for computer gaming, the evolution of console gaming and esports as disruptors to both the entertainment sector as well as the sporting world. Digitization and digitalization in the built environment. The digitalization, use of new digital technologies, of the built environment has been occurring since the 1960s with the advent of computing in the office place, and in particular with computer aided design, CAD, becoming by the 1990s a primary tool for architectural education and practice. Over the last 20 years, the advancement of CAD based programs and technologies has seen the production of hyper real virtual environments, as well as the development of parametric modeling, where all graphical and data outputs for a design are based on a virtual model. The easiest way to explain uh, a parametric model is if I move a door by a meter in a plan drawing, because that plan is generated graphically from a permanent link to a virtual model, the door will move in any stored output from this model, as well as on the model itself. If I then change the size of the door, say from a single door to a double door in the plan, all outputs will reflect this, including any schedules or specification documents. Parallel to the development of this software was an approach now commonly known as Building Information Modeling, or BIM. It recognizes not only the benefits for a designer in using CAD within their own working environment, but as a collaborative tool for the sharing of common digital model across several of the professions involved in the design, development, and construction of buildings and infrastructure. Furthermore, this approach on a data-rich model also means that digitization of design can be seen as a whole life project for a building, with the same model acting as the data source for the management of the building operations right through to the end of its existence and eventual demolition. This BIM approach also represents a digitization, the conversion of analog to the digital of the paper-based process of project management, offering the collaborative planning and strategizing requirements in a virtual environment. Sounds impressive, right? It is, and the potential alone for greater efficiencies in time management, cost, materials, etc. are significant. Sounds expensive too, right? Indeed, some of the key software and licenses run into the thousands of pounds. Except, remember that disruptor, the smartphone? There is now freely available open source CAD and BIM software that you can use on your phone. What has this example of digital acceleration to do with esports? At the core of CAD and BIM are many of the same technologies developed in gaming. The visualization software and the growing use of virtual and augmented reality are technologies driven in large part by the commercial power of the gaming industry, worth more than $130 billion in the United States alone. I have worn a virtual reality headset to walk across the building a colleague had designed, which allowed me to navigate the building as if it was real, as well as accessing service ducts and other areas no human being could usually enter. I have also worn the same technology to join my fellow Erasmus Plus colleagues in a deep dungeon filled with vampires and zombies on our visit to Khan. In both instances, my motion sickness got the better of me. However, I can easily see future planning meetings for students building designs occurring in a virtual environment where their building is full size in front of me, as long as I keep very, very still. The potential is huge, and the last 11 months have accelerated the use of these technologies in my sector because students and built environment professionals have had to work from home. Furthermore, gamification has long been a feature of built environment education, both to encourage younger people into the sector and to use enhanced gaming environments to progress designs. Colleagues at the University of Ulster, Northern Ireland, have developed tools using the popular block-based game Minecraft to teach BIM. Furthermore, two of my students have, during the lockdown where they did not have access to university computers, used both Minecraft and Sims, the life simulation game where you can design your own homes, uh, to create environments to sell their design assignment schemes. There are a few examples of how the use of Sims uh, to show a warehouse conversion project on the course sheet. While we're on the subject of Sims, one of my 2020 students who participated in the Erasmus project, whose work was featured in the week three session on eSports centers, actually became interested in architectural design as a child through creating homes and spaces for her Sims family. 
Currently, it would be true to say a physical model of a building or a scheme has much more reach with the public when selling a project, in part because of the tactile, tangible nature of a model they can touch. I've seen this when students have produced both CAD fly-through models and physical ones for public projects. The intangibility of CAD models still leaves some people unimpressed if a physical one is available. However, imagine as immersive technologies advances, uh, sensory elements such as smell and touch are added to the virtual visual modeling. Uh, match that against the growing use of virtual technology and we could be approaching a point where virtual visualizations of built environment projects become as impactful as physical models. This is again technology driven by gaming with the implications beyond just esports and the built environment. Imagine if your online shopping during the lockdown was more like a walk through a digital environment where you could pick up and feel a product rather than scrolling through a series of 2D images. What has COVID-19 shown us? How we have all individually coped with the lockdown and how this will be considered and reviewed on a wider scale will be understood better when the pandemic is finally over. Personally, I have had to create and record all my content for this MOOC at home, just as I have to deliver a year of lectures, seminars for work and assess student presentations. Gaming and esports will have been a key feature of how many people will have coped with the pressures of the lockdown. And it will be interesting to see how escaping to virtual worlds has helped in these instances. Even before the pandemic, there was anecdotal and study-based evidence of the positive impact gaming can have on notions of well-being. A University of Oxford study announced in 2020 stated, while gaming alone cannot help a player feel happy, the study not only suggested gaming helps people feel more happy, but prolonged periods were seen as a factor in this outcome. Such studies should help counter the stereotypes of gamers and esports we discussed in week two, and hopefully start a different discussion of how the sector can be seen as a positive for people, as well as drawing down the obvious links we have considered here in this session to the built environment, for example. However, there is a pertinent statement a number of people have shared in the United Kingdom when our leaders tell us uh, we are in the same boat with regards to COVID-19, that we are in this together. The statement is, we are in the same storm, the pandemic, but some of us are in boats while others are holding on to life rafts. This is also true for how we have separately experienced the digital acceleration before and during the pandemic. COVID-19 has exposed inequalities in our societies between those who have access to adequate broadband speeds, those who have digital hardware capable of handling virtual events, and those who do not. This is before we even consider if everyone actually has access to a laptop or a computer for their sole use, or even have such equipment at all. Furthermore, we talk about the potential of virtual spaces as a means of engaging and knowing some people do not have the physical spaces in their homes to engage with these virtual activities, be that because of overcrowding, sharing a bedroom, etc. As we race towards a potentially fascinating future of greater digital acceleration in how we live our lives, we need to acknowledge those already left behind by this process for during uh, before, during and likely after the pandemic. Whether we are viewing this from the perspective of how esports has been part uh, of a digital acceleration and is likely to continue to be a key contributor, we need to ensure we promote gaming and esports as inclusive activities across measures that include addressing digital poverty. A final consideration regarding digital acceleration is the need to consider those people who do not wish to participate fully or at all in this aspect of human development. Can a digital acceleration count for a blended approach or still allow for more analog engagement from others? In this instance, let me share with you one last anecdotal story. I once interviewed a social housing chief executive who wanted to give all his tenants an iPad so they could access his organization's services, paying the rent, reporting rare repair requests, rather than calling his offices in order to allow his staff to engage with other work. There was some resistance with many people saying they did not know how to use this such technology. However, he knew most of his tenants had smartphones and so he decided to visit the estates his organization managed to conduct what he called the Amazon test. This involved checking with delivery drivers and postal staff to see how many of the homes received packages ordered online. Over a few weeks, he was able to confirm the vast majority were receiving such parcels. 
This meant someone in each house was using some form of device to order online, so he could justify sending out iPads to change the way his tenants engaged with his staff. The future really is, at least in part, digital.